make the mistakes that others make. And I think the, one of the old saints was very wise in his remark that evil actions become known to all. Uh, virtuous actions usually remain unknown. This is perhaps the best. The inner life of the individual is not worn on his sleeve. It is not something that he has to talk about, that he has to be persecuted for or ridiculed for. The good life is something simply to live straight. And to the most part, in the long run, this is respected. But it causes no violence in society. In the ways, as the scriptures point, if have pointed out, the treasures that are stored up in the inner life of the individual are not taken from any other person. No one is poorer because we get stronger in righteousness. No one is deprived because we gain greater insights. Material problems make us perhaps pauperize each other, but the spiritual integrities of life help us to redeem and enlighten and protect each other throughout all the years of life. Now, there's a, there are various ways of trying to get to this point, and one of the ways, I think, is through a kind of meditative visualization of the situations as they exist. Behind this little thin veil that divides the physical world from what we cannot see, behind this veil is everything that is important. And we haven't quite got the vision to see it. Some think they have and hope they have, but very often their testimonies are arbitrary and conflicting. One thing is true, however that through a kind of internal meditation upon the realities of life, the recognition of big things in nature and in the universe, things that we may see either in a great tree or in a tiny flower at the foot of a bush, things that bring to us nature, that show us the infinite diversity of activities which make up life the ever-present manifestations of a divine energy, that all things live because of one life. All things live because that one life is growing in them. And the growth of that life is evolution. It is the spiritual ideation, the final unfurling and unfolding of the great divine potential in the end that we may all become as gods knowing good and evil. That must come in the due course of time that we shall become this particular being, a being in which the perfection of life is glorified, and that we become great not in ourselves but because of an eternal greatness that lives within us. The Oriental mind, particularly in the Northern Buddhist system, uses the concept of the uh, Lord Maitreya to recognize the ever-coming reality. The word Maitreya, or the Buddha to come, who is waiting to be born into this material world, is a personification of a principle. It is not a man sitting up in a heaven somewhere waiting to be born, or a woman doing the same. The actual point of it is that the ever-coming Messiah, called Maitreya in the Orient, is simply a word which means kindness. The word Maitreya, the savior of all nations, is kindness, and it is to come. It is waiting somewhere to come into the lives of all of us. Kindness is the healing power. It is the miracle. Kindness winds its way through all phases of existence. It binds up all wounds. It ends all animosities. It closes forever the gates of wrath. So somewhere this kindness is. And one place where we know it is, is in ourselves. We have had moments of it. There have been moments when we were very kind. Then there were moments in which we forgot to be kind. There are moments when we have been heroic in the terms of the expression of the best parts of ourselves. But then we get back to the daily procedures of life, and all these things fade out, and we begin again to nurse our little selfishness at the expense of the greater part of ourselves. 
Now, what is the answer to it? Supposing we did try to cultivate kindness, that we recognize that wherever kindness is, the blessing of heaven is upon it and upon those who practice it. Supposing we say, well, that's going to be very expensive. If we're really kind, we're going to have to forgive people for things they've done to us that we don't think were fair. We have to try to get over the common impulses to improve our situations. We have to get over the tendency to be a little unscrupulous in the fulfillment of our own ambitions. These things are going to be difficult. The question is, uh, is this true? It might be true if we were going to be here forever. But what is the reason why we cannot do these things in the view of the fact that in a short time we just aren't going to be here for a while? Now, we may be back, but if we come back, we will be ruled by the degree of kindness that we have developed. The one thing we can take with us is self-improvement. And if self-improvement is nursed and nourished, it is the one asset that can come out of material life. Ten percent on the bonds won't. None of these things can. They may all be all right in their place, but wherever the individual allows unkindness to motivate his action, he is committing a mistake. And that mistake is going to stay with him until he corrects it. And it is always going to stand between him and joy, between him and peace of soul, between him and his own conscience. Now, conscience is very valuable in this particular situation. Some have felt that conscience is a sort of hereditary virtue, a sort of self-hypnosis. But it isn't, because conscience tells us very definitely when we violate our own code, conscience may not interfere with us if we don't agree with someone else. But if we commit an action detrimental to our own life, conscience is there. But this little voice of conscience seems to be getting weaker every day. And very few people now allow it to interfere with anything they want to do. But here we have a world in which we're not going to be able to want to do these things. It's closing in all the time. The mistakes we have made are becoming more and more difficult to remedy. Therefore, we must begin to realize that we may have to live for quite a while in an environment almost completely dominated by mistakes, things that shouldn't be, things that should not have occurred but did. To meet this, we have to have strength of internal character. If we don't have strength, we will fall back on corruption and perhaps uh, find life completely miserable. We have to have strength of character to face the way things are now. And it is because we haven't developed that strength in the past that things are as they are now. So at the moment, the most important thing we can do is to develop a sufficient degree of strength to sustain us through difficulties, through tragedy if necessary. But if it's tragedy, it is tragedy we have earned through thoughtlessness and selfishness. But we have to have greater strength than we have now in order to face the present world confusion with peace of mind. And faith is the only thing that we have that can stand against the disasters of life. And this faith is not an excuse. It is not an evasion. It is not something we simply do to try to deceive ourselves. Faith is a deep realization that the truth exists, that we are part of that truth, that in spite of anything we can do or try to do, that truth is still there. We must make peace with that truth, for the truth in itself cannot make peace with us. We have to make the gesture, the motion ourselves. And if we do this, we can find out a little bit about, for instance, the Pythagorean discipline that I just mentioned. Namely, that by looking back into a day or a week or a year, we see a microcosm of our entire lives. We can understand the motions that dominated us. We can realize how early childhood affected us, 
how much we developed and how much revenge we nursed and how we determined to get back at society because something it did to hurt us or why we haven't been able to go on loving everybody because someone deceived us. Why it is, therefore, that almost everything that goes wrong is remembered and everything that is right is more or less overlooked. Little by little we become more and more pessimistic, more and more doubting, and more and more alone because of our own attitudes. So we should look back over these things and see what we can do to straighten them out. With a little effort, you can probably turn a long period of disillusionment into a pretty nice time of life. We can see that we misjudged things, we uh, talked too much, we carried stories that were not true, and if they were true, they were none of our business, and then little by little we got into trouble. So we can look back and we can say, well, I don't think I graduated from my own past cum laude or anything of that nature. I probably nearly flunked the course up to now. But there's always a possibility of making a great advance by watching the result of past mistakes. So this Easter, let's try to say honestly and firmly and really that we do not have an enemy in the world that we have no one we wish evil to or ill. We have no one we are afraid to meet tomorrow or today. That we have nothing in our lives or in our relationships with life that we cannot face constructively. That if, we, if the truth needs to be told, we will tell it. But we will tell it always with kindness, never with bitterness. We will never insult other people because we think they deserve it. The more they deserve it, the more they need help. Everyone who is wrong is suffering from some kind of mental, emotional, or physical sickness. Selfishness is a sickness. Hate is a sickness. And the hate is a sick sickness that is worse than any malignancy that you can have in the body. All of these things we can think through. We can begin to figure out how we could make a better life. This is part of the secret of the Oriental Mandala philosophy. A mandala is a visualizing or a picture meant to represent a spiritual reality. Spiritual reality, realities cannot be actually visually seen. They are far off in the great world of causes, but they can be experienced to various degrees. And the experiences suggest patterns, parables, allegories, fables, and emblems. These, this recognition of the nature of the infinite cannot be brought to us on a film or something of this nature, but we can build within ourselves the vision of its proportions, the shape of it, the glory of it. We can, to a sense, gain for it a certain form, a likeness, a habitation in a body of some kind, if that body is only our own thought. But if we begin to glorify the invisible, if this becomes more and more wondrous and luminous, it also gives us greater strength with which to fight the problems of the visible. We will no longer regard the things around us as omnipotent, and will begin to move our faith, our hope, and our conviction towards this vastness which we begin to experience and which we know has to be there. There's nothing else that could support the galaxies that go on forever. There's nothing else that could ensoul all forms. There is nothing else that could give us the power of sight or the power of thought. All these things represent forces beyond our comprehension. But we know they're there. And we know, therefore, that they are part of a plan and that we are all purposed creatures, not individuals simply floating around in a mist of matter. So with this realization coming gradually through us, it becomes much easier and less difficult for us to experience the kind of life that we need, the kind of life that will bring us uh, internal peace. And at Easter time, we could imagine that you're standing perhaps in a great cathedral 
like Chartres, or perhaps one of the most beautifully ornamented, the Cathedral of San Marco in Venice. Here, the walls and the ceilings are covered with the most beautiful mosaic pictures. Pictures in the domes of the various rooms that rise up like clouds into the sky. We see the heavens unfold as in the chapel of the Vatican, the Sistine Chapel. Everywhere these mosaics, paintings, symbols represent a larger world, a world beyond our comprehension, really, but a world which in some mysterious way we know has to be there, because if it was not there, we would not be here. We are inevitably bound to causes that we cannot see, without which our own existence would be impossible. So we look up at all these beautiful pictures that are dreams, ideals, visions, inner convictions of exalted moments in the life of an artist or in the life of a great cleric. And in these things, it seems as though the sky is opened and we behold the glory of the infinite. Now in our own little private life, Bamey, the German mystic, was one who had this experience of the opening up of something beyond the common sight of man. He had this inward vision in which for a moment he beheld the glory of the world. He beheld the infinite expanse of power that was necessary to make a grain of sand exist. He recognized for a moment the light that ensouls and ennobles a, a seashell. He began to sense all of the glories that surround a budding flower, and most of all, the tremendous cosmic pro progress, the pattern of things, the infinite pageantry of causation, a pageantry which can be mysteriously felt in a moment of ecstasy, ecstasy which is to religion what his terrier is to problems. This is the tremendous vision that Bamey had. He beheld the great light of things, and he realized that behind it all, somewhere, is the supreme mystery, a mystery that cannot fail, that is absolute, that nothing can add to or detract from, and that it's in this mystery that everything that exists lives and moves and has its being. And it is the power of this wonder that helps all of us in our own small lives to live better, to live more constructively. It helps us to understand, and most of all, perhaps, it gives us faith. The faith that comes from the sensing, the intuitive realization that there is this greater thing, this more than we can ever hope to understand. Certain visions have come down to us relating to it. Mystics have described it in various ways. Perhaps their descriptions are all tinctured by their own personal developments. But still they have sensed as Plotinus did the tremendous power of that which can be experienced occasionally in the inwardness of things. Plotinus mentions that for one instant he was aware of reality. For a moment the great gates opened and then they closed again. But for that moment he lived the rest of his life. He needed no more. He had suddenly had an experience that convinced him beyond doubt of the tremendous integrities of life. Now we found some way we're going to have to restore the experience of integrities we are going to have to find our way of bringing our world back into order. We are going to have to discover what love really is. That love is not in being loved, but in loving. That love, as St. Francis pointed out, is the individual without reservation bestowing the noblest of his, bestowing the noblest of his emotions upon those around him, expecting nothing in return that the great power of things that is in the innermost, this mystery that Bame, Bame tried to describe, 
gives forever and asks nothing. The power of good is fulfilled by its own bestowing. That all that is beautiful and noble is its own reward. And the quiet life of intelligent integrity is itself a greater reward than any bestowal could possibly be. For it simply means that the individual has got back in line with the facts of life. So at Easter this year, we're working hard. Many people are now becoming more and more aware of the challenge of the day. Millions of people today are beginning to realize that the problem is a challenge. That it is not something that was simply dropped on them for no good reason. More and more of us are realizing that the mistakes that have been made are the reason for the problems that are now facing us. And there is a grand motion, a very definite motion, toward the restoration of the integrities of life. It, at this time it is limited to a few, comparatively, but it is in the hearts of many. Many people are make, planning changes in their ways of doing things. They are planning to build better structures. Educational reforms are taking on tremendous momentum. And it is becoming obvious that the only education that counts is the education that is built upon the great cosmic pattern by which we are all educated. Little by little, we have to learn that education means the bringing out from within ourselves of the divine power that is, that is deposited there in eternity. Educo, meaning to draw forth, has been interpreted to mean cram in. Uh, we have crammed in all the things we didn't need to know. We have built up a tremendous reputation for abilities that will only serve us until we retire. But the thing that has to happen is that conscience and consciousness have to come through the individual. We have to be taught to become what one Montaigne, I think, once called a pen in the hands of a ready writer. This coming through from within is the, is the real end of education. The real end of society is that, as Cicero said, society is, has as its ultimate that all human beings will live together in social compatibility. Society means that. Civilization means that we shall all be civil. That we shall not build upon differences but upon common causes. All the way along, people are, me are beginning to realize this. There is a strong movement now in the re to reform the, uh, the entertainment field. We're getting hopelessly disillusioned. We're getting bored to death by an inundation of commercialisms. But this is a... We've done it. Each individual who thinks he's got five cents to profit keeps it up. But gradually it is becoming so obnoxious that most people are disillusioned. The returns and records and announcements on various reports show that entertainment field is losing ground very rapidly. Why should it? Because to the large measure of things it isn't entertaining. Actually, entertainment must be useful. Entertainment must help to the individual to see the values of life. Entertainment must have certain background in realities. And it must also inevitably put, point out the importance of that which is the best. Until these things happen, entertainment will be contrary to the conscience of many people. And this conscience is becoming more irritated every day. The same is true in land allotments, in food, in clothing, in natural resources. All these are gradually coming into focus as proof of the fact that we have been indifferent to integrities, that we have been thoughtless, and that we have allowed personal and immediate considerations to destroy the world, or try to destroy the world, which was given to us to beautify and protect. So little by little, the Christ in us, which is the hope of glory, is breaking through. 
We are finding it in nations that have long been trying to establish godless societies. The godless do not increase in number. The godless are not gaining in power. Many of them are turning back to something that gave them internal consolation in integrity. Little by little in many countries which were considered atheistic, the churches, the mosques, the temples, the cathedrals are opening again. Why? Because, as Napoleon once pointed out, you cannot rule a people unless that people have a religion that is strong enough to take them through the problems of life. So that all the way along, the motion now is toward perhaps the thing that we have talked about. Perhaps the second coming is a new channel on a television station. Perhaps it is an, a, a director who decides to make a really good picture. Perhaps it's an author who is going to write a book for the good of humanity and not for royalties alone. It will also come when products are improved and the manufacturer says, I'm going to make a good product. The moment he says it's a good one and he makes it, he is tuning in to the great realities of life. The same will be true with health. We will discover that it is not necessary to exploit the sickness and miseries of each other. Little by little, these laws and rules will be changed. Little by little, the experience of humanity inevitably brings us back to the truth. We can't get along without it. Therefore, all the deceits of the ages, the thousands of wars of the past, the inquisitions and the conquests, which have mutilated society from the beginning, these will gradually destroy themselves because they cannot continue. We are gradually reaching a point where we have exhausted the potentials of our own stupidity. We have no longer anything to support the foolishness that we continue to consider to be so important. So I think we must ex accept the simple truth, namely, that every Easter things are going to be a little better because every year that lies between is going to make changes more inevitable. And, uh, and we, Nostradamus, in his predictions, for example, described that in the next century there would be the coming of the Periclete, the Prince of Peace, that we are coming closer and closer to the time when reality is going to break through with a crash. Reality is going to come through and it is not going to be a deathbed conversion. It's not going to come when it's too late to do any good. It is going to come as the intensities of the present problems and, uh, become obvious. But when we look at the world today, we must all, I think, admit that it is in foul condition. It is in miserable condition. It cannot go on this way indefinitely. We will have more wars and rumors of wars, but there will not be such long ones. Not so many people will fight them. Not so many people are going to be intimidated into doing wrong for self-preservation's sake. Little by little, these things are going to clear. And looking over the last year's reports, there seem to be so many rather hopeful signs and indications of people waking up finding new values, finding greater privilege and opportunity in working with the young and, and uh, taking care of the desolate. We are becoming here a nation accepting into ourselves the sufferers from 50 countries. Now, it may seem this is a terrible strain upon us, but I think it is the way that Christ would have wanted it, namely, that we shall take care of the little ones, and that those who suffer, we shall sacrifice for them if necessary. All the way along, the sorrows are bringing their own solutions. Peoples are beginning to find new, new goals, new rewards for action. A simple society run on normal processes and principles and dominated by brotherly love could solve most of our problems. 
We may say that it would be hard on the economic system. It wouldn't be, because the economic system has always existed primarily for one purpose, and that is a convenience. An economic system makes it unnecessary for the individual to carry the groceries in his own pocket. He can buy and sell without delivering the animal right there on the marketplace. He can do things, he can have things through a great exchange. This can continue. There can always be proper exchange, but it can be fair and honorable and just. We can do all the things that are right, and having done them right, we will observe a quietude, a peace, a gentleness coming in. We shall not be troubled by people who have led them narcotics and alcohol simply by the stress and weakness of their own natures. Little by little, it's going to come through. I feel perfectly satisfied and always have that never will this world be left without the guidance it needs. The only problem we have is to recognize it when it comes. If we don't recognize it, that isn't even so desperately uh, bad because it's going to come whether we recognize it or not. And we're going to have to live with it. And for a moment it may seem uh, uh, rather oppressive, but in a little while we shall discover that it is easier to be happy and honest than it is to be ambitious and dishonest. All the things that we don't like are, go are going to gradually be transformed into what is right or we will learn to like that which is best. So on Easter, I think we ought to think about these things as much as we can with a view of making new resolutions in ourselves and trying in our own hearts and minds to see the sky open and the heavenly victory of truth over the injustices of material existence. We are victims of a material ignorance but only when we do have contact with the inner part of our own lives can this ignorance be corrected. And the ancient symbols, the mandalas, the various uh, emblems and diagrams of the past, the visions of the great artists, the Madonnas of Raphael and Tintoretto, all these great works of art are inspirational works, all based upon the concept of the reality of something sacred, something important, something divine, by which we can lift ourselves out of the mire of our own making. Therefore, at this time in Easter, I think when we sit down to Easter dinner or something, we should have a little prayer in our hearts and minds that our eyes may be opened. For it is in the opening of our eyes that we experience the second coming. It is the, in the opening of the eyes that we behold the resurrection of truth out of the darkness of error. Of era. It is always happening, but we do not have the eyes to see it. When our own hearts and minds illumine our visual equipment, we will see that forever the truth is becoming. It is coming always. It is always unfolding through life and through living things. It is unfolding through us if we will permit it. And by kindness and thoughtfulness and gentleness, we are bringing closer and closer the day of the great liberation, when there shall be one uh, sheepfold and one shepherd. Until then, until we have the vision to see they have always been one, we will have to continue to gradually overcome the differences, overcome the uh, short-sightedness, overcome the thoughtlessness which have uh, so long bothered us. It might also be a very good day today to telephone someone you haven't talked to for a long time and see if you can uh, mend some little misunderstanding. Try and be bigger than something else. Try and not do it for the sake of your own good, but in order that the Christ in you may have a victory. For in every kindness there is a victory for good. Every unkindness is a defeat for the good that is in all of us. And when we have enough unkindness, then darkness rules. And the time has come now where kindness is getting to be necessary, is getting to be something we can't afford to go without much longer. So wherever we go and whatever we do, let's uh, try to be cheerful. Let us know that, the, that God is in his heavens and all is right with the world. Let us have faith in the integrities of life 
And with the rebirth of faith in our own hearts and minds, we have the resurrection of faith in the world. And in each of us, the mystery must first be celebrated. We must first discover that our faith is stronger than our fear, that we can go forth doing the things that are necessary, ready and willing to bear the responsibilities of constructive action. Until then, we will have the same problems. We can't go much longer. The nuclear warfare is around corners, but it will not be allowed to hurt. It will not come to its ultimate um, victory, because there can only be one victory, and that is the victory of love. Everything else must pass away. All the hates and selfishness of empires. The great empires of the past are gone. The empires of the future will go also, unless truth controls and directs their existence. And we are now not only able to see these things, but we can read about them. History is available to us. There is much to inspire us to make the changes in ourselves that are desperately necessary. And when we make these changes, we shall no longer fear. There will be no fear of what might happen to us, or what we have, or who we are. These things cease when a great faith takes over, and we realize that at all times and forever we are part of a divine plan, and the God in us can no more die than the God in space. This is something we have to learn to understand and recognize and do the best we can with. But let's, uh, in Easter this year, uh, let's try to think through some action. It's only a small one. And say, I do this in the name of the Lord. I do this little deed. I give to someone who needs. I say an encouraging word to someone who is in tears or in sorrow. I hold out friendship to someone who is alone. I try to bring peace to a troubled person. And if what is necessary is a loaf of bread, I'll find that too. I will do something as a restatement of my bond with heaven. I will do something to prove that I still believe that love is supreme and that all the problems of fear and hate are not strong enough to destroy the principle of human goodness that is locked within us all. And so, for all of you, I wish a very happy Easter.